We gather in the presence of God's Spirit, who invites, encourages, forgives, and heals us with God's loving presence and grace. Thanks be to God. Please remain standing as we begin the our openness.
summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifest witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. It um, sets up the sermon for today because sometimes we wonder, don't we? The final question that we're dealing with in our I Wonder series is this. I wonder why bad things happen to good people. I wonder why bad things happen to good people. Now, my initial response is this. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? I mean, think about the world that we live in. Why wouldn't they, with all the complications of it? And if, even if you think about the biblical story, the question is, why wouldn't they? So let me take you back to Jesus' beginning of his ministry. And so he's been baptized. And the first thing that happens, even before he gets into public ministry, is that he's cast out into the wilderness, and there he's tempted for 40 days. So here's the story. Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted for 40 days. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God... Command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it's been given over to me and I will give it to anyone that I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. 
Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written that he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they'll bear you up, so that you shall not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Here ends the reading. So take you back to the question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, you see even in the story of Jesus that they happen to him frequently. First of all, at the beginning of his ministry, he's led into the wilderness, tempted for 40 days. If you go throughout his ministry, he is in constant conflict with especially the religious leaders at the time, like this withering gaze that they have in, in perpetuity. He cannot get aside from them. And at the end of his life, we all know what happened. The religious leaders and the political leaders put him to death. So let me kind of reflect this through the question. Um, do we believe that Jesus was a good person? We're good on that? Are we in agreement on that? <laughs> I hope we're in agreement on that. Did bad things happen to that good person? Why would we assume anything different for us? So that's just one level of it. That's kind of the spiritual big story that we're part of. But there are also, I think, very practical things. Listen to these practical things. Um, how many of you drove today? All right, see, all of you got here for somehow through driving probably. Well, uh, today in Minnesota, there will be 205 car accidents. And 87 people will be injured. And one person will die. That's the average every day in the state of Minnesota. In the summertime, lightning strikes 270 people, and 27 of them will die. And interestingly enough, of those 27 who die, a high proportion of them are sinners who don't go to church for a long time, and then they walk into the door of the church, and they say, I bet lightning is going to strike me, and bam, it does. <laughs> It's really remarkable. It's really remarkable how that all happens. 27 people will die from lightning strikes this summer. How many of you are fast food eaters? Yeah, see that? You're a, you're a walking time bomb right there. You are a walking time bomb right there. How many of you uh, have had or know somebody uh, who's had COVID? Probably most of us. So I want to put those out there and say this. Um, driving accidents and lightning strikes and COVID is not asking anyone what their moral IQ is. They're not asking anybody, are they good people or not good people? They just happen. That's the hard part about living in this world, isn't it? Now, I'm going to take you through a couple more layers of this particular question. So if we start with, why do, why do uh, bad things happen to good people? Let me ask you this question. Uh, what makes a good person good? What makes a good person good? Now, we just uh, assumed that Jesus was a good person. Are you still with me on that one? We still there? Okay, good. Uh, let's say just the big hist uh, person in history, Adolf Hitler, we'll put him at the other end of the spectrum. Guess what then? Most of us are where? Right here. So what makes us a good person versus somebody else? Is it because 80% of the time we do good things and 20% we don't? 70-30? 60-40? 51 49 <laughs> just over the line every day, 51-49, I'm rocking the good person zone. What makes everybody a good person? Now, I want to even push this out a little bit farther, because in the context of the church, if you think historically, some of the stuff the church has struggled with the most are issues around sexuality. And so uh, 
they would, they would cast people out of the church for divorce or cast people out of the church for adultery. Remember that story in John 9 where the Pharisees were gonna, ready to stone the person caught in adultery. I mean, these are, these are the issues. More recently, people have been uh, uh, left out of the church because of their sexual orientation. We've had a long history of really focusing intently on those kinds of issues. But I'm going to tell you this today. Jesus spends about this much time on those issues. Jesus spends about this much time on issues of our possessions and what we do with them. If you just look at the numbers of times that Jesus teaches about things, he would, you'd have to say that a good person is a person who takes the wealth and capacity that they have and is ultimately overly generous with it. That's the rating scale if you just want to use Jesus' teaching. It's kind of complicated, isn't it? What makes a good person a good person? So if we're going to ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Mm, where do we even fit in that equation? So then the next question is, uh, what are bad things? What are bad things? Like, is anything that causes you harm or distress a bad thing? When I was, uh, right before my senior year of high school, my parents moved from Iowa City, or from Morris, Minnesota, to Iowa City, Iowa. So that was a bad thing. <laughs> I'll just say it. That, what makes a bad thing? That made it a bad thing. Now, I was bargaining with them along the way, and I said this. I said, hey, you know what? Uh, what I'd like to do is I will stay in Morris for my senior year, and I'll just stay with some of my friends. Well, the reality is my, my parents knew my friends. <laughs> and their nicknames were Diz, Freak, and Weed. <laughs> Which means this wasn't going to go well. It wasn't going to go well at all. And so I ended up getting to go to Iowa City with my parents. And then I ended up making their life as miserable as it could be for months and months and months on end. Now, in retrospect, I look back at that time and I say, you know what? It pulled me out of a place in some relationships that weren't really good for me. It also put me into, now Iowa City is not a metropolis, obviously, but it, there's a big campus there, which means that there was a lot more diversity than I ever experienced in Morris, Minnesota, and it allowed me to be able to see the world in quite a different way. And it also started to give me the space, I think, to become who I was going to be. So, was it a good thing? When it happened, no. In retrospect, there's some good things that happened from it. So see how complicated all of this is? You think it was an easy question, why do bad things happen to good people? You should say, oh, they shouldn't. Um, but the reality is they do. So how do we wrestle with it? I'm going to even push it a little bit farther because in the, in the temptation story today, uh, underlying the temptation story, I think that there are two big struggles that are happening. And the first big struggle is this. Is life all about me? Or do I have to trust something outside of myself? Either God and or community, etc. Is life just about me, or do I need to trust something outside of myself? That's one of the big struggles that are happening in the temptation. I'm going to suggest that it's one of the big struggles happening in our culture right now. Is life just about me? Or do I have to understand my life as some part of a bigger whole, a bigger world? There is a, uh, in the book of Judges, so it's an Old Testament book, and there's this grind that's happening between uh, the people of Israel doing really well for a while, and then they don't do very well, and then they do really well for a while as a people, and then they don't do very well. And when, they ha when they're not doing well, there's a great line that describes it, and I think it has a lot to say about where we are right now. It says this, and the people did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. Ooh, you got it, didn't you? I heard that moan. The people did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. You can't live in community like that, can you? Think about the untold harm 
that is happening and has happened in our world because people don't have an understanding of our responsibility for one another in community. Second thing, there's a huge issue of power. Like, what do you do with your power? Remember, Jesus is on top, and the, the, supposedly Satan's going to give him the power over all of the kingdoms. Issues of power are huge. And so the question is, what do we do with the personal power that we have, the relational power that we have, the corporate power that we have, the communal power that we have? We can use it, can't we, for benefit. Or we can use it to harm. Think about all of the, the systems in our world throughout, uh, even the United States throughout time, where there have been systems put in place that seem to benefit some at the expense of others. It's issues of power, aren't they? And it causes suffering. It causes pain to happen in the world, in people's lives. That's one more layer of complication in all of this. So sometimes my head just feels like it's going to explode when I start to think about all of this. And so uh, it's, it would be easier for me to co come up with a simpler phrase or simpler solution. And there is a default phrase that's happened within our culture and happens in our religious traditions. And it goes something like this. Um, everything happens for a reason. Now what people do, and I, and I hear me out on this. Because I'm sure that I've said that somewhere down the road. And, and it's really hard when people are dealing with difficult things and you don't know what to say, to say something. But I think people default to that phrase, but I don't know that we think through the implications of it. There are two levels, actually, for me of that phrase that, that I kind of even like better. One is, um, uh, everything happens for a reason. The reason might just be the stupid thing you just did. <laughs> that might be the reason, right? Or everything happens for a reason. This is from Kate Bowler's book. Everything happens for a reason and all the other lies that I've loved. All the other lies that I've loved. Whew. I think it was the second funeral that I did in my previous congregation was uh, for a six-year-old. She would have been 30 this year. Is that right? 30. I remember everything about that moment. The room that we were in, almost what people were wearing, what pe how people were gathered with one another. I ju it's just emblazoned on my mind and memory. And what it was for me was this absolutely pivotal time where my theology about how things happen or don't happen was rocked. And I had no answers. I had no answers. And if somebody would have said to me and or the parents at that time, well, everything happens for a reason, I would have said, what would that reason be? What would that reason be? So there's some ambiguity. There's some complexity about the world that we live in. There's some really hard things. Uh, Douglas Sean Hall uh, wrote a book, uh, God and Human Suffering, a number of years ago, and, and he, he phrased it or he put it in two categories that were helpful for me. And the, the helpful thing about it was that it gave me something to hang on to, but it also gave me, allowed me to say that there's some things that I simply won't know. He talked about these two things, and you'll see the words up on the screen. He talked about the suffering of burden, and he talked about the suffering of becoming. Now, the suffering of becoming, he described as this. It's the things that are just wired into the world that we're going to continue to bump into. And when we bump into them, hopefully because we bump into them, we discover something new about ourselves and we become more the person that God hopes us to be. He even goes back to the Genesis story and he asks these questions. We always think Genesis 3 is a perfect uh, Eden utopia, like don't we all want to get back to Eden? But he asked this question, why was there loneliness in the garden? The first person was lonely. Why were there limits in the garden? If there was perfect freedom, why was there any limits there? Why was there temptation in the garden? And he just puts out the fact that he says, maybe we just, the design of the world, right? How the world is in relationship with one another and the freedom that we have to make choices 
continues to push us up against different levels of things that might be discomforting to us. And the hope and the goal is that working through them, we continue to become more of who we're anticipated, hoped to be. So that's the suffering of becoming. It doesn't dis diminish how hard it is. So when I left Morris, Minnesota, it was hard. And I didn't think, you know, as a 17-year-old, I didn't know what that was going to be like. It doesn't diminish how hard it is, but there is a, a becoming that happened through it that I couldn't have known probably otherwise. So the suffering of becoming. The second one is the suffering of burden. And the suffering of burden is, is basically two characteristics. One is, uh, it's the result of sin, individual and corporate sin. So we do things to one another that cause harm. And it's not because you're a good person or a bad person. Unfortunately, that's our nature. We do things to one another that cause harm. And the second thing is, we build systems that also cause harm. And so some work to the benefit of others more than the others. And so we're part of a world that it's the suffering of burden. People just have to bear the weight of it. And sometimes it's their fault. Sometimes it's someone else's that has caused them. Sometimes it's part of a bigger world that's caused it. And the second thing about it, the suffering of bur uh, burden, is this. It's the mysterious suffering that we just cannot name. We can only bear and endure and hopefully walk through. Elie Wiesel was a Holocaust survivor, and uh, he was in Auschwitz when he was a teenager, and he spent the rest of his life after he came out um, trying to give people a sense that even in spite of the, the desperate horrors of humanity, that there can be hopeful things. And he said this, you'll see it on the screen, we must hope in spite of despair, because of our despair. We must not give despair the victory. I do not believe the world is learning. Oh, that was a painful statement. I do not believe the world is learning. Are we learning? Are we learning? And I cannot hide from the fact, and yet I do not believe in despair. Think about that from where he was. I do not believe in despair. People speak of a leap of faith. I believe we require a leap of hope. One of his students right after that said, Show me some evidences of hope. And his response was simply this. He said, uh, in places where there is no hope, we must create hope. Because there can always be hope. Maybe in the end, the ultimate question is not, uh, there's not an answer to this ultimate question. There's just a posture, a way of thinking, a way of being. As we think about why bad things happen to good people, ultimately, maybe our only response is just a leap of hope. A leap of hope. Amen. Take me to the king, I don't have much to bring, my heart is torn in pieces, it's my offering, take me to the king, truth is I'm tired, options are few. But where are you? I'm all churched out, hurt and abused. I can't fake what's left to do. Truth is I'm weak, no strength to One 
touch will change my life. Take me to the King. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn to pieces. It's my offering. Lay me at the throne. Leave me there alone to gaze upon your glory and sing to you this song. Take me to the King. Truth is, it's time to stop playing these games. We need a world for the people's game. So, Lord, speak right now. Let it fall like rain. We're desperate. We're changed. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful day in the life of the church when we have the opportunity to welcome a new member into our community of faith. And today is a wonderful day that we are going to welcome Evelyn Ray Ness into the body of Christ. Her parents, Brian and Christy, and sponsors, welcome to all of you today. God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us new birth into a living hope through the sacrament of baptism. By water and the word, God delivers us from sin and death and raises us to new life in Jesus Christ. We are united with all the baptized in one body of Christ, anointed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we are joined in God's mission for the life of the world. Brian and Christy, I ask you, trusting in God's grace and love, do you desire to have Evelyn baptized? If so, please say, I do. Parents, as you present Evelyn for baptism, you are entrusted with gifts and responsibilities to live with her among God's faithful people, bring her to the word of God and Holy Supper, to nurture her in faith and prayer, 
so that she may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others in the world that God has made, and work for justice and peace among all people. Do you promise to help Evelyn grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, please say, I do. And sponsors, we ask you, do you promise to nurture Evelyn in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's spirit and to help her live in the covenant of baptism and fellowship in the church? If so, please say, I do. And people of God, do you promise to support Evelyn and pray for her and her new life in Christ? If so, please say boldly, we do. We do. Congregation, please stand as you are able. Through baptism, we are called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Therefore, with the whole church, let us confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by the word you created the world, calling forth light. At the river, your son was baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit, initiating his mission among us. Pour out your baptism spirit, the power of your living word, and those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise now and forever. Amen. What do you think, Evelyn? Are you ready? Yeah. Evelyn Ray Ness, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. She says, what's going on here? And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, that through the water and Holy Spirit, you give Evelyn and all of us new birth, cleanse us from sins, and raise us to eternal life. Sustain Evelyn with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the gift of wisdom and understanding, the gift of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. It's okay, Evelyn. Yeah. It's okay. You're doing great. Evelyn, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. He died for you, and for you, he conquered death. And all of this he did for you, little one, even though you know none of it, nothing of it yet. We love because God first loved us. At this time, parents, I'd like to welcome you to anoint Evelyn by saying, mark, with, mark her with the cross on her forehead, Evelyn Ray, child of God. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Well done. I think all is well. Today we offer you two gifts. One is a gift of this candle. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so I say to you, let your light so shine before others so they may see your good works and glorify your name in heaven. And on the anniversary of Evelyn's baptism, we encourage you to light this candle to remind her of who she is and who she is. And also, we have this gift of this blanket, and it's been tied partially by members of our congregation who have prayed over it, but we ask that you continue to finish tying it and praying over it for Evelyn. Through baptism, you have been received into the household of God, entrusted with the good news of Jesus Christ, 
and strengthened to serve by the power of the Holy Spirit. Congregation, you're, here's your, here are your lines. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us as we give praise to God and bear God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Please join me in welcoming Evelyn Ness to our faith community. Evelyn is very good at waving, by the way. So if you want to wave to her, she's very good at waving. There you go. Yes. Thank you. You may return to your seats and extinguish the candle. Thank you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive the gift of Holy Communion. Let me begin with the word of welcome so that you know that you are welcome to this table because Christ is the host. Christ takes all of our burdens and in exchange gives us forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation. All are welcome to this table. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you happen to come in, or if you are a visitor and did not happen to pick up one of our communion cups, uh, please raise your hand and an usher will deliver that to you right now. There is cellophane on the top for you to just peel back for the, to, for the bread. You peel the whole thing back for the grape juice. And if you are at home, also gathered with your communion elements, as you take these elements, hear these words for you. The body of Christ is given for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. If you have children who have not yet received the First Communion blessing, you may mark them also with the sign of the cross and just remind them that Jesus blesses them and keeps them in his love. as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let's sing together. When I 
lose my way and I forget my name. Remind me who I am. In the mirror, all I see I'm who I don't want to be. Remind me who I am. In the loneliest places, when I can't remember what place. participating in worship today. Thank you to Ginger Commodore and congratul thank you so much. What a gift. Congratulations to Evelyn Ness as a new member of our church as well. If you happen to bring a financial gift for tons of love or for the ongoing ministries of our church, there are baskets as you exit. Uh, please continue to keep a little distance as we go through these um, interesting times in our world with our pandemic still going on. And now hear these final words. May you never wonder how much God loves you. Now go in that love and serve our risen Lord. Thanks be to God. See you next week.